that I get really inspired by is seeing a younger man actually take control of his life and really shine and actually inspire other people. And today we're going to be speaking to a, a young gentleman who has inspired me and hopefully he'll inspire you. This is Joey Bartatula, and welcome to the Secret Men's Business Podcast. On today's show, we're going to be speaking to Cam Rosen, and he's going to be telling us a little bit about his story, his life, and how he finds inspiration and hope within himself and how he can inspire others. Cam, the man, how are you? I'm very well, Joey. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for um, coming on the show. Just to explain, I guess, to our viewers, our listeners, sorry, um, I met Cam because he reached out to me to interview me on my podcast and on his podcast. And now I thought, you know what? He really inspired me with his story and I um, wanted you guys to listen to his story. So before we start, Cam, do you want to, I guess, tell the listeners a little bit about about yourself? Uh, where do I start? I mean, it's not very... Where you're from and all that stuff. I'm from the United States originally, Montana, a um, little town called Red Lodge, which is at the uh, foothills of the Beartooth Mountains and grew up with an Aussie mum, American dad. And then eventually they decided that Australia would be a good opportunity for maybe living in a uh, harmonious society. Not that Montana wasn't harmonious, but education opportunity, uh, this is a good place to be. So we, we made the move. It was supposed to be a couple years. Uh, ended up staying, what, this is year number 13 now. Wow. And what do you, can I ask you, like, I always find it fascinating how, firstly, the difference between America and Australia, but then secondly, do you know why your parents chose Melbourne? Was it because when your Melbourne parent or your Aussie parent lived in Melbourne? Yep. So mum, mum grew up in Camberwell. Right. Okay. And so what, how do you see, what do you see that are the main differences between the two countries? I mean, coming from Montana, it's not a easy place to generalize as you know what the rest of the united states is we're mm-hmm. very isolated we're very small town um very very communal so it's not at all related to what it's like to be in la or new york or chicago so mm-hmm. all i can say about montana really is that they're look despite what people see on the media it is it's not the kind of chaos that we might think it is it's well like the, you're talking about like in the bigger cities yeah, exactly right. You know, in yeah. bigger cities, it's not the same kind of chaos. Um, of course, we have we have sensationalist media, and it paints a certain way. And you're not going to be able to tap into the algorithms of these small town people doing beautiful things. And it's uh, you know where we're from in Montana, it's nature is everything to those mm. people. I was going to actually say that, like uh, that last statement you made, I think it's so true. You don't really know until you go there. Do you know what I mean? Like I remember going from San Francisco. I think I went to Lake Tahoe, yeah. And so we have to go all through these towns. And you're right, it's totally different to what you expect or what you'd see in the bigger cities. Um, so for you, um, tell us what it was like living in that small town and what, how you perceived, I guess, your own personal growth by being there. I mean, it was a beautiful place to grow up, um, you know, in terms of how – as far as childhoods go, I, I had an amazing childhood. Um, <clears throat> we were a, kind of a different family in terms of uh, it's a very religious place to be. Uh, mm. United States is a very religious place to be, but also the the more isolated, the more rural you get, um, the bigger role religion plays in those communities. And so we had a town of 2,500 people. In that town, we had nine bars and 12 churches. And so there's almost a church for every person. And yeah. Being one of the few people that I knew of that were not religious, um, there were some, uh, not points of conflict, but points of questioning there, I think. Because um, when, you're, when you're raised in a family that teaches you to question everything, you begin questioning everything. And then mm. if you're questioning uh, things that other people just consider as, as true, why, why, why bother questioning it? It is what it is. Mm. But, but why and how? And so that could lead to some contentious moments, but overall, a, a lot of learning. Um, mm. you know, so, had, did, so did the people, because you were questioning everything, did the people in the town look at you as if you were, you know, why aren't you conforming? Or did they, did they bring up anything in regards to your way versus the religious way? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to be included. Um, and I remember, I think it was 
third or fourth grade, I got invited to after school church camp. And I thought, all right, let's do it. You know, they always rave about it. All my friends are having fun. So we went and we had juice boxes and cookies on the playground. And I was like, this is the best. This is awesome. And then we sat down for the Bible reading. And I remember looking around going, this, this is strange. <laughs> because if you've never been taught those mm. things before, and then they're reading it from a book, you go, hang on. Is this always been like this? Is everybody just, it, it's okay with this? It's, and so from there, and look, it was, I, I remember having arguments with my friends. We'd be jumping on the trampoline. And um, my, my, my best bud, Drew, he'd always say, um, you know, God did that. I go, what do you mean God did that? He goes, God's everywhere. He's doing everything. I go, well, what about the stars? He goes, God made those. I go, but they're flaming bowls of gas. How could he have done that? And he goes, well, God, and it, it would just go down and down and down and down. Hmm. So one of us would probably get frustrated with the other one. And he was, he was always trying to push my buttons. He knew, he knew how to trick mm. me. And, did, uh, he, did he change at all through his, like, did he grow up, grow up and then start to see it different? Or do you think that he maintained his religious beliefs? Oh, very much changed. Uh, like I said, he, he went from God made that to what God didn't make anything? <laughs> essentially, yeah. Yeah. Because especially when you, you, know, you go through high school and then he moved to college and moved to a different town and he's no longer surrounded by the same kind of influences that he was before. Uh, and then also the internet. You know, that's, that's being and girls, that's all, all of the above. And so <laughs> yeah. you combine the internet with, um, you know, Going. new communities and just meeting new people and you go, oh, there's a, there's a bigger world than the one that I was growing up in. Yeah. So how did you, um, you were talking about being on the playground, which again, I totally get it. It's like, you're like thrown into a foreign country in a way, wasn't it? So how did you, you know, get around it in your own head that you were living with these people that were very religious, that there was. 12 churches in the town um, and not, you know, get affected by that. Do you, you know, I wanted to, I sort of want to explore how you um, have an individuality because that's what I was drawn to with you is that you're, you know, you're quite individual. You don't get, let other people influence you. And I wanted you to sort of share your story so others can maybe learn from you. So what did you do so you didn't get impacted or teased or affected by the norm of the town? Well, one, one nice thing about Christianity and growing up in a small town with those kids is that they're, parents instilled into them pretty good morals. So there wasn't really a lot of teasing. There wasn't any bullying because you were different. So you get some funny looks and you get some questioning looks from the parents when they go, hang on, Cameron's not Christian. He's not religious. Should we have him playing with our kids? He's going to infect our, <laughs> our gonna, He's going to infect them. <laughs> but, you know, as, as a child, you're wandering through the world, piecing together your, your, your viewpoint from the little bits of information you get here and there. And while we weren't religious, my mom certainly was is spiritual. So we had you know little little Buddha statues growing up in the house, always doing incense. And so I, when I was, I'm not sure how old I was then, maybe five through ten, I thought I'm I'm a Buddhist, <laughs> not having any idea what that meant. Mm. All I knew is there was something to do with reincarnation, and if you were bad, then you get reincarnated as a cockroach, and if you were good, you get reincarnated as a prince. And so I just thought that's that that'll suit me just fine. And so we still had, um, look, you just it was never an issue it was always there were plenty of other things that were um <clears throat> probably more difficult to wrap my head around i mean for one um this might be nsfw but being certain being not not being circumcised mm. going to the pool one day and seeing all my buddies i went hey hang on what's 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 going on here what's different here mm. and i went home and i said mom i think you've done me a dirty because none of them have what i have and I was the only one in that shower that that looked that, out of mm. place. And then that brought questions on board. And then that you know that that can um, when you are the only one, you it's hard not to feel a little bit isolated. Yeah, I think your I think your foreskin represented in a way everything. Yeah, about the you know that was the representation of everything that you that you were experiencing, which you know. I mean, can I? What was it like in the reverse? What did your friends think of your house? <laughs> and your and your parents <laughs> like you know if you, if you had things that you hadn't been noticed not like aware of then they must have always all come to us and gone oh my god this is what is this museum what is this place <laughs> exactly right essentially it was a museum mum was a um like a historical bead trader and so she would have all these old strands of beads from africa you know three four five hundred years old and strange masks and whatnot and so they would come over to my house and go what the fuck is going on here and then mom would serve, serve them up some ethnic dinner, some kind of curry or something, a little bit of spice to it. And they go, this doesn't taste like goulash or spaghetti. 
like this is this is very different and then yeah. they, they loved my mom because she would she would swear in front of them she was an author mm. yeah but well, i just love it i just love that it's the it's really a symbolism or representation your you know your story represents how people can easily be influenced by something and you're like this individual bud that is you know growing through all the chaos so you know, when you were living there, um, how, what were your influences? Or who, who, who did you admire in the outside world or even in the town that allowed you to become who you are? I had a third grade teacher, Mr. Sager. He was uh, one of the first probably real influences beside my parents. And he, I remember it was, I learned a lot from him because he was a very deeply religious person, but it wasn't the type of religious that... Uh, you know, wants to push it on another people is kind of find your own path. And if you find the path that I'm on, that's fantastic. And if, if you don't, then I'm sure you'll do well anyway. And I remember he made us all uh, handmade bows and arrows that I couldn't even draw back until a couple of years ago. So it wasn't really a risk. But from there, he you know, taught us about how to really appreciate nature, see what's going on in front of you, this, this, this dance of organisms that's resulting in what you see going on around you every single time you hear an elk bugle. Or you see a, a bear, you know, running through a meadow. It's this this dance of life that makes where we are so special. Mm. So from there, and combined with my my dad's uh, job, which was a whitewater rafting company, nature and being outdoors was was everything. You know, we didn't have video games in Montana growing up. A couple of my friends did, but if you were not outside, then you weren't living you weren't doing anything yeah i mean let's get uh, i'm gonna definitely go look this up after i finish this conversation but give us is it like are we talking mountains and all beautiful I mean, you know when you're talking nature is everything i'm picturing in my head just mountains going on everywhere and green everywhere and so it was like that right yeah very much like that high alpine streams um snow year round on the mountain caps uh rocky mountains which were we we live at the base of the beartooth pass which goes from five and a half thousand feet where the town was up to almost 12,000 feet and truly a, a, one of the last frontiers of wildness, I'd say. Wow. Yeah. So how do you cope with Melbourne? <laughs> it took a really long time. It, I, I mean, yeah, so how, how, what was the first culture shock, do you think? Just not, not having access to that, to that nature? Yeah, being, being starved of that. Because everything that I did, everything that I enjoyed had something to do with the mountains, whether it was skiing or, you know, potentially dirt biking, whitewater kayaking, rafting, fly fishing, all of those things combined into you, you attach those parts of you to your identity. And so when I came over here and all of those things were gone, it's, it was kind of a, a little identity crisis. And so yeah. that you, you start to develop maybe f from the inside rather than the outside. That makes well, sense. I'm guessing you found ways to adapt because, like, I think last time I spoke to you, you were in, down the coast, right? So, is that where you are now, or are you in Melbourne now? Uh, I'm down in Bowen Head, so about 20. Right. Long okay. Long. So you've sort of found a sort of mini. I know it's not where you're from, but it's like a mini connection to some form of nature, I guess. And 100. percent uh, Getting really into surfing was a complete game changer because I think that any time that you can extract joy from your surroundings. It's it's going to give you a different level of attachment, and then from there, as you as I get slightly older and maybe slightly more mature, you begin to realize that as cliche as it is, happiness does come from within. So you need to be able to not rely on any extraneous influences in order to be happy, because you don't know when you'll be able to do those things again. Like you don't know if once those things are taken away, whether it be because of moving to a different place or whether you go through an injury or something like that, if every single ounce of your enjoyment in life comes from an outside thing, then it's not a sustainable thing. It's not a mm. type of... But listening, but listening to you, I sort of get this feeling that you are quite adaptable. Like, again, I'm really impressed. Like... You know, you knew that you wanted something, you were craving something, and you hunted out and you found surfing. It's, that doesn't, you know, for a young guy, that is impressive because a lot of people might get depressed or a lot of people might go and drink a lot or whatever. But, you know, you, I think that you find what you like. So when you look at the landscape of other young people around you, 
Um, and I know that you probably go through your own things anyway, but like, what do you think are the main things that you're observing with people in your, uh, in your age group in regards to mental health? I think that, at least in my friendship group, it's almost like there are quite a few people that have been given all of these tools to interface with the world in an entirely different way. They're given the motivation in the form of whatever's popping up in their algorithm and uh, the hustle lifestyle, and <clears throat> you can do whatever you want and you can succeed at it and you can be wealthy, but they don't really know where to start because they see other people doing things that they're interested in and they think, well, maybe I'll do that or maybe I'll do that. But there is a, uh, it's, it's difficult because I'm coming from a privileged perspective when I'm, I, I'm deeply passionate about whatever I'm being involved in, and I have somewhat of an ability to make things happen when I do get obsessed. And so it's difficult to speak from the perspective of somebody that. Well, I guess, well, do you want to share maybe? I mean, I know what you're saying. I mean, but I think that, you know, I think everyone has choices. So, you know, I think that's the reason why I wanted you to go on the show. I want to understand your process of choosing to go down the path of adapting rather than going down the path of being the victim or being not using your resources, right? Like, you know, you came from a small town, you had sort of stuff going on and you adapted to that and you were able to, you know, go to the after school thing and understand what your friends are doing. And you didn't, you know, you did that. So how did you do that? Or who taught you how to do that? So you would be able to feel privileged. I mean, well, the age of information, the, the digital age, being able to transport yourself through a podcast into somebody's conversation between two brilliant people from the age of 14, 15, that's a pretty incredible tool. That's, mm. a, that's a paradigm shifter for sure, because suddenly it's you're not just conversing with the people in your immediate family or your, your immediate friends. You are becoming involved in a you know, two, three hour conversation between intellectual people learning new ideas challenging your old beliefs and and showing you that there are options and that as long as you it's 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 a task of dedication yeah you, well, know, you know but again um, i've got nieces and nephews and none of them want to listen to podcasts <laughs> so you must have you know was that an influence because your mother was spiritual like do you think that you were introduced to these things by uh, other people or did you find them by yourself because there's a curiosity inside of you um well the curiosity is always inside you it's always inside me but it's also uh having the fortunate privilege to have been surrounded by people that see that curiosity and foster it and help it and so you That's know good. who you surround yourself with is a is a massive determinant of of what you can achieve and so i remember the first when i started listening to podcasts is because my uh, my cousin byron who's a very close friend of mine um He's 12 years older and he saw, all right, this kid's curious. He wants to know things. I'm going to show him what I'm learning from. And then immediately now we're, we're listening to those things. We're talking about those things. And from there it grows. I mean, I've, I've had many evolutions in, in span of a you know, short period of time. If you had asked me what I was going to do with my life three or four years ago, I would have said, I'm going to be a photographer. I'm going to do, do videography and cinematography and maybe something to do with music and who knows? And then I started a nursing career and I almost dropped out of that. I almost dropped out of my nursing degree because I thought, oh, I don't see myself working in a hospital ward. I just don't see myself working in a place with you know, flashing lights and ominous beeping sounds and sterile environments all the time when it is so foreign to my, to my nature, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, I found enjoyment in that and I thought this is not a bad career. I can certainly enjoy this. And then through that, Look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not good at being stagnant. Um, there's a part of my nature, I think, that uh, I'm very dopamine fueled, which is, you know, the 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 upside to dopamine dominance means that I really enjoy my work. Um, I love the process of it, but then the downside is, a, you have a propensity to burn out, which I do, and then <laughs> B, I um you don't really celebrate the wins as much because the actual achievement is less important and less fulfilling than the, the yeah. process of getting to that. Point. Yeah. And you're also about, it's about the next thing, isn't it? I mean, I, I guess that's a really good point is, you know, now that you know that, how do you, how do you stop and celebrate? Because you've achieved a lot for someone your age and I can see all those guitars behind you. So there's all these things that you love to do and you're not like 
someone, you know, it's it's interesting when you speak to someone and they say, and you ask them, tell me what you like to do, and they don't have no answer for that. I see that so many times in my therapy clinic. And then to hear, listen to you and you can sort of, you know, be influenced by another perspective. You know, there's this desire to learn. There's a desire to be um, informed and to be educated. And, you know, so how do you manage those burnouts? Uh, well, look, I'm... I'd be lying if I said I knew how to manage them exactly. Uh, I, I wish that, and this is something that I'm that I'm working towards now. It's a that that personal development where <clears throat> instead of vacillating between a hyper frenzy work mode and a state of near catatonic dread, <laughs> I would have to somehow find the middle ground and sustain that. Yeah. So, are you saying do you have balance? I try. Like, do you have do you have downtime, or are you one of these guys that doesn't like to sit still? Um, I I have forced downtime. Yeah. Um, and I so I I. Not always, but I generally use my weekends well. Um, I don't really sit around. I need to get out and detach from the things that are going on, especially, you know, the phone and digital media, because it, it, it's an onslaught. Mm. And uh, I guess you've also got now, you know, the awareness that you're raising about how you're, you are aware, I guess, about what's going on. Are you able to listen to your body? Because really, I think if I do the same thing as you, but like now what I'm doing is I really, because I was going to say, when you love your job, like you were saying about the dopamine rush and you just love what you're doing, so it doesn't come across as work. You sometimes get, there's like a blurred line between am I overworking or am I just having fun? Mm -hmm. But you're working still. So I just listen to my body and my body now tells me quite clearly when it needs downtime. Is that what you do? Uh, well, my my mind tells me I need downtime because it stops working well. Right, okay. <laughs> when that happens... Um, I can now. Now I can sense it, and I used to try and just work through it. I go, "Come on, you got to get these things done. You ha you put them on your list. So that means you need to get them done." And then I get to the end of the day and go, "You've just ruined the next two days for yourself because you're 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 borrowing from tomorrow's energy. You're, you're mm. from stores that are already depleted. Whereas if I had a you know, on those days where I feel myself getting burned out, stop and go. I will tackle this tomorrow when I'm refreshed because if I do it tomorrow, then I'll get it done." And if mm. I, it'll also give my mind the opportunity to to balance. I can, I can imagine you being a multitasker as well, can't, aren't you? I don't know if it's multitasker or a little bit. <laughs> it could be. It could be anything. Yeah. Um. What do you think? And I know you're not an expert. I'm just asked the opinions because you're of that age. What do you think are, are some of the um you know some of the deficits in regards to how the younger generation is being handled with mental health? Like, do you think that there is? Are you happy with the way that it's going, or do you think that there's a, bit, a few holes in the system? There's, there's always holes in the system, and there's always so much room for improvement. It does make me uh, positive and optimistic to see how much things have progressed just in the last 10 years, just in terms of um, awareness and, and advocacy. Um, I think that placing an emphasis on, on being vulnerable and, and, and speaking about what's on your mind, I think that's become far more prevalent. I got plenty of friends who I reckon a few years ago would never have spoken the way that they're speaking now. And it could be a result of them you know, getting older, but also getting older does not mean you get more open. You know, totally. You, That's you totally true. Closed off. Yeah. So it's, I think that it's fantastic that. Especially for men, isn't it? Like it's evolved a lot for men over the last even five years. Yes. Um, I think that. And it helps to have people in your life that you feel comfortable talking to. Um, mm. I think that it's, it's, it's really difficult for guys to reach out and it's really not common for us to be proactive in our health and rarely are we even reactive you know something comes along you go that hurts i guess it just hurts now mm. that's what it does yeah um, and even like when you were saying when you moved to australia and you you know you had to make new friends and all that like a lot of people may struggle with that but how did you do that because i think that's a really good point like i think especially when you get older a lot of people will will say things like it's hard to make friends and you know because a lot of times people have got established groups and it's hard to penetrate that group, which I think that they're all myths. I mean, I think it's all got to do with, you know, timing and it's got to do with, you know, really connecting with the right people. How did you, how did you do that? Well, uh, being different helped. Having, an, <laughs> you know, having an accent yeah. in a different place that you, you are uh, like the specimen that's come in and everybody wants to look at you and go, say that word again, say this and say that. And then from there, of course, you wonder, do these people actually like me or am I just a, a, a fad that they're going through right now that they'll drop off next year? Mm. But overall, I think that uh, I, I always 
had a longing for my friends in the States. I always missed them deeply. Um, and that was, you know, difficult at times because I, I did for a very long time feel like I just didn't fit in any group. I could, I could social chameleon and I can mm. act like I fit in. Um, but in the back of your head, you're like, you don't belong here. <laughs> what do you think you're doing? They're going to find out that you don't belong here too. And so through, you know, but through the previous years, it's not about the, the quantity of the friends that you have. And I'm very, very thankful to have the, the group of friends that I do have uh, and group of mentors that I do have. I'm not a party animal and I'm <clears throat> not super social either. I'm very much a, a homebody. If you call me at 7.30 on a Tuesday, most likely I'm not going to answer. If you call me twice, I'll pick up. But overall, I, uh, I get my social energy from being alone. And I mm. spend a certain amount of it before I <clears throat> need a bit of a reset. Yeah. And also, I think you've got, you know, really, if you look at your your schedule, you're doing a lot. You know, it's not as if you're, you know, you're surfing, you're doing all these things. And so, I, you know, it's interesting talking to you because I feel a lot like you. Sometimes there are people that, like, get off by going being with people. So there's the social butterflies, which it's funny, I used to be that. But now I've sort of adapted and become more like you. I now get more joy out of projects and my own space and having a few friends. I don't need to know everyone, you know. So um, can I ask you what is or what do you do as a self-care process? Like what's your daily routine or, you know, your routine in regards to clearing, grounding, connecting to yourself? I mean, I, despite a hectic schedule, uh, and a lot of projects going on that that need to be managed with uh, you know time management. I am inconsistently consistent or consistently inconsistent, and so <laughs> I, I, I I really do struggle to 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 um, stay on a certain track. I make sure I get my exercise. I know that if I don't, I'm not nice to be around, and my mind isn't working the same way that it could be, and so. Um, as long as my body is tired and my mind is tired by the end of the day, that's part of my self-care. And also, um, I mean, I don't know if uh, nutritional supplements are a form of self-care, but they are for me because I, I, I work better with them. So I'm all about nootropics and uh, biohacks and anything that I can do to hit my stride a little bit easier. But then also, I think that uh, creativity is a, is a massive aspect of it. Um, mm. I'm usually... Um, not usually, but I sometimes indulge in a little bit of cannabis and then I sit on my couch and I play guitar and I just, yeah. I, I, I explore whatever I can. And usually by the end of that, you have been refreshed. Mm. Like you, you've yeah. just tapped into a different area of your brain. That's not necessarily problem solving anymore. It's, it's more of a fluidity. And if you can tap into that fluidity, those, those flow states are healing. Mm. And I guess you also surf, which is a form of like mindfulness in a way, isn't it? It's like you're you out there, sort of out there in the water on your own or with a tribe of other surfers. And, you know, because I was actually curious if you meditated, but do you find, it sounds like there's a lot of things that you do are quite meditative, like playing music is meditative. Um, the surfing would be definitely meditative. So you, you have a lot of things in place that sort of help you to clear your mind that isn't traditional in a way, even though you've come from a spiritual background. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you can practice mindfulness wherever you are. Mm. The, I mean, the goal, one of my goals when I go out and surf is get to the point where there are no thoughts coming in or out. It's just, you're there. Mm. And it's, it's easy to do when you get out back of the sets and it's a beautiful sunset and um, you're surrounded by people that are having fun and you're seeing smiles on their faces. That's, that is something that instantly grounds you. It's mm -hmm. impossible to walk away from that in a bad mood. And so yeah. I know that it is, it's a psychological reset. It is the, a powerful grounding mechanism, but that can be achieved you know, however many ways. Mm. But your energy is pretty amazing. I'm sorry if I keep, I keep blowing your trumpet. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, it's just nice to meet someone that has got a really beautiful energy. And um, so what do you see as the, the obstacles that are going to come up for people your age group or younger over the next, you know, 25 years? What are going to be some of the things that you guys have to face when you start to get older? Oh, dear. I mean, it's it's just a, you know, I mean, like, because we all have this, this, I think, imagination that it's going to be all these sci-fi, you know, AIs everywhere. I mean, like, it may be, but 
I'm guessing, you know, I mean, like when I read articles about careers and how, uh, you know, AI is taking over and, and all that, I mean, I'm, I'm really very close to retirement and I get nervous. So I, I wonder what it must be like to be younger and think about what that's going to look like for, you, for them or for yourself. What do you, do you think about it at all? I do. I do think about, uh, I try not to be an alarmist, um, but some of the people around me will know that I am. Um, really? Well, in, in the sense that, there are things going on that nobody seems to know about or care about. You know, mm. the, and, that, and that concerns you, does it? It concerns me. The environmental issues are a massive concern to me. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I, mean, I guess you've seen it and you've lived in it. So it would be overwhelming to imagine. Imagine where you've come from being depleted. Yep. I mean, we our, our glaciers are gone. They're melted. Um, we used to have, we, we have a national park in Montana called Glacier National Park, and it has no glaciers in it anymore. And that is just such an infinitesimal example of what's going on in the world. And um, industries like, like the fishing industry, I'm not sure if you've watched Seaspiracy, but. No, but I've actually, I actually watched it, um, a Four Corners uh, a, 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 like interview about fish, fishing, and I, I was sort of blown away by how they're building all these fishing farms and how the pollution that's being developed. It's, yeah, it's just, it just blows my head up. Yeah, and so look there, I, I, my, my deep fears, um, which I don't think will be materialized, I hope they're not materialized, only because I have the same kind of inherent faith in intelligent people and ingenuity and new ideas that hopefully somebody will come in um, mm. for the final bell and they'll have this miraculous solution. And that is a... Um, it's a coping mechanism of sorts because I can't be sitting here being scared about you know 30, 40, 50 years down the track when Australia's burned to the ground and there's no fish left in the sea because that's no way to live. And despite how chaotic things do feel, if you go sit by the beach or sit by a river or go to a forest, there's no chaos. There's no chaos at all. And so you can find that peace wherever you are. But in saying that, water refugees, you know, things like that, and then not even getting into the technological aspect of things, I think that these, obviously, they're tools for good and they're tools for evil and they're tools for destruction. And it depends on how you use that tool. You can use a hammer to build a house or you can smash every finger in your hand if you're not careful. So I think that um, connectivity is going to be an issue. And I think it already is becoming an issue. Just people learning how to communicate with one another, um, whether it be you know, seeing somebody at a cafe and you want to ask them on a date. Do people have that confidence anymore? And if they don't have that confidence, then they don't have a confidence. In it's so funny. You know, I know people that have gone through that scenario and rather than going and asking for a date, they go onto their Tinder to see if they're on there. And it's like, oh, my God, you're sitting opposite them. Um, what technologies do you, are you excited about? Like, you know what? I instantly feel that you're going to be one of those people that goes to Mars <laughs> or goes to the moon or something. Like, uh, you know, what do you feel uh, is going to come our way that you're really looking forward to? Uh, well, I'll never go to Mars. I like Earth too much. It's beautiful here. But I, I'm almost, um, the technologies that I'm most excited for are the ones that are going to help us understand what's already happening here. Um, I think that uh, my, my, biggest form of excitement comes in the form of these future medicinal therapies, you know, in the forms of ancient molecules that have evolved over billions of years and being able to utilize those to um, influence meaningful health outcomes for people rather than just medicating them. I'd like to see a world where there is no palliative medication, meaning you get prescribed something and you're on that until you die. I would like to see us progress. And I think we will. It's inevitable that as, as the regulatory and law frameworks of the world catch up to where society is, then we'll be in a wonderful place because society is always, you know, 20, 30, maybe 40 years ahead of the law. And when we get to that place where we're actually able to uh, commit to true autonomy and make decisions about our lives that don't impact others, and then through that, be able to make informed decisions about our health using these natural tools, then I think that that will be a pretty incredible leap in terms of broad health status mindset mental health everything and so those those technologies are amazing i wouldn't mind trying out elon musk's neural link and uploading my consciousness to somewhere as long as i could pull it back <laughs> yeah uh it's, it is pretty scary a little bit it's a little bit scary but it's also a little bit exciting to think 
you know, have, you know, I always think that only 10 years ago or so we had the introduction of the iPhone, 15 years, whatever it is. And now it's like, you know, it seems like it was so far away, but it was just a blink. So it, it is pretty overwhelming to think what is going to be possible. But at the same time, I think once we get it, we're excited because there always seems to be launches of things and everyone gets so excited. You know, people queue up for the new phones. You know, imagine queuing up for an AI, you know, home domestic robot. <laughs> so there's going to be all this stuff that we're going to have access to, I guess. I think that, uh, that that's going to be another one of the challenges is that we have access to so much stuff and it's going to fuel um, consumption, overconsumption. And I say that as a consumer, I'm surrounded by things. I got things everywhere. Um, but I try to ground myself in the sense that I know that these things are not happiness. These things do not make any real significant betterment to my life. But unfortunately, you know, approaching 8 billion people in the world, it's the, the, the sustainability of our righteous consumption is a, is a scary thing. So anything that allows people to connect with themselves and, and generate that, that joy and happiness without needing to consume, 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 consume. And honestly, be a th free thinker. Don't let these companies and these conglomerates tell you what to do, tell you what to think, tell you what to buy. You know, detach yourself from these and mm. stand on your own, I reckon. You should be president. <laughs> <laughs> Cam, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I mean, we've talked offline, and I know that you've got a new job coming up, which I won't say what it is at this point because I want you to come back and speak about that because – that's another interesting topic. But, you know, you're an inspiration and you are a delight to be someone of your age and with so much intelligence and depth. So thank you so much for being on the Secret Men's Business Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward okay, to it. Okay, guys. So um, this is the Secret Men's Business Podcast. And if you want to subscribe, just hit the link below and click on like and notifications will come so you get to know all of the segments that the Secret Men's Business on SMB TV hands out. And the podcast will be out on Mondays and Thursdays. Have a great week, guys. Get out there in nature and do what Cam does. Bye. Mm -hmm.